back for week two of the Bobcast with Frostburg State University football coach Delane Fitzgerald. The Bobcats 1-0 after defeating Stevenson on Thursday night, 34-7. Frostburg State remains the number eight team in the nation. And, Coach, you said last week you expected a closer game than last season. Were you yourself surprised by your football team on Thursday night? Yeah, not, not surprised, but pleased. Um, the, the young men played really, really hard, and, and, and we played for two hours and 45 minutes. So we played from start to finish and, and gave great effort. Um, out of that, Andy, there, there are 10, 15, 25, easy, 25 little mistakes and, and big mistakes that we need to correct going forward if we're to um, have, have the season that we expect to have this fall. I want to go to the, the turning point of this game, and that may have occurred when the score was, was 0-0. Late in the first quarter, your offense has the ball facing a third and nine on your own two-yard line. Connor Cox finds Malik Morris for a 92-yard completion. The next play, Jamal Morant scores. It, it's surprising to see a, a vertical pass in that situation. Why was that play called, and, and why did it work for your team? Well, on third and nine, you have to call something with some vertical routes in it in order to get to the first down marker. Um, Malik, Malik Morris is king of the big play. Connor threw him a ball that, that was catchable and that he could go up and catch, and he was able to keep his feet and, and run for 92 yards. We, we've had some fun this week um, or the last couple of days heckling Malik about getting caught from behind. Malik thinks he's really, really fast, but um, he got ran down on that play. Had, had a chance to have a 98, 99-yard touchdown and gets run down on it. But anyway, we've had some fun with Malik, um, and, and he'll correct that and probably won't get caught from behind any more this year. Um, Malik's made a lot of big plays over his career for us and seems to make more big plays than little plays, um, but, but did a nice job the other night, three catches for somewhere around 140 yards, but did a nice job there. On, on that drive, the thing you have to smile about is Malik's from Baltimore and then Jamal Morant's from Baltimore, and the two plays made in that drive were by Malik and Jamal on the catch and then the touchdown run. So you're really, really happy for them. They get to go back home and with sort of a homecoming for them and do well in front of their family and friends. And that led to a 7 to nothing lead. I do want to stick with the offense. 44 rushing plays and some of the scoring drives. The second scoring drive, 8 of 9 plays were running the ball. The fourth scoring drive, 11 of 12 plays were we're running the ball. The The offensive line had two new players. You've got a new fullback. What can you say about your offense and how it was able to run the football effectively against Stevenson? Yeah, and Andy, we're going to run the football here. Um, but we're going to run it, and we're going to run it effectively. And we're we're going to be a tough blue-collar football program. Uh, don't really care who the personnel is. Um, I did not know those two stats about us, you know, running at 8 out of 9 and, and 9 out of 12 on, on the scoring drives. Um, but, but it sounds about right for us because that's who we are. We're going to run the football and then play action off of that and have wide-open receivers. Well, in terms of newcomers up front, what did you see – uh, on the offense, two new starters on the offensive line and, and a new fullback in terms of, of that group and just being physical. We're rotating three guys on that left side, and, and Gene Robinson and Jason Money and Wade Olson are rotating on that left side. Um, J Jason Money and Wade have been in our football program now for three seasons, and this is Gene's second season. So although they're new to playing and, and playing meaningful minutes in the game, they're not new to us and not new to our coaching staff. All three young men are more than capable of being successful at, at this level and doing what we try to do, that they just have to have great weeks of preparation and show up on Saturday night at, with a hunger and a focus to be successful. Well, they were this past week. I want to shift gears to the defense. A lot of different faces. Uh, that group held a senior quarterback to less than five yards an attempt. What did you make uh, defensively of your team's performance? I'm real happy with how hard they played. Andy, there's a lot of um, alignment alignment issues and, and adjustments that we have to fix. Um, pass rush lanes and, and gap integrity on defense have to be fixed for us. And then we, we left some sacks on the field the other night, and I think we sacked the quarterback for four Stevenson times. four times and probably should have been eight or nine times. We, we left some on the field, and we've got to correct those things. But, but like you said, we've got some new faces and some young guys, and, and they're getting some game experience now. And the expectation is, is that they get better going forward. A hallmark of this Frostburg defense the last few seasons, last year especially, was getting off the field on third down. Stevenson got into 10 third and six plus situations and nine times your defense was able to get off the field. How was your team so successful in getting to third and long situations and then getting off the field? Yeah, if we hadn't created, if we hadn't committed a couple penalties, the stat would even be better than that one. Uh, preparation during the week. 
and and John Kelly and the other defensive assistants that they, they work real hard at situational football and, and we get people in third and medium and third and long and, and then we just execute and we get off the football field what, what do you say we we prepare them for those situations all throughout the week and then the young men go executed on Saturday a 34 to 7 final however I think the, the score could have been even more lopsided. A couple of penalties. Stevenson, two fourth downs turned into first downs on their scoring drive, pass interference in the end zone, giving them several more opportunities. Uh, how does that improve throughout the season? Yeah, qu- questionable rushing the passer call um, that, that kept that drive going, and then we committed a, a pass interference later on in that drive. So two big 15-yard penalties kept the drive going for them, and that was their only scoring drive of the game. Um how do we keep it going throughout the year? It continue to prepare each week and, and be focused and for the young men to show up and play hard on Saturday. Also, Stevenson faked a punt in that game st- successfully. For Frostburg being a, a big name now, do you expect to see other teams pulling out stops like this? I'm, I'm thinking back to Kane last year where they attempted a, a reverse pass, something to that effect. Are you, are you looking for that, especially when teams – see your personnel and, and know that we're going to have to get one or two breaks to come away with a win against you guys. There's two theories of thought here, and, and, the, and the one is kind of our staff. We like to have a good time, so we're going to have a reverse or a double pass or a flea flicker or something in the game plan. We're, we're going to have two special teams fakes in the game plan each week, and it's just kind of who we are as a staff, and it's our personality, and we have fun with it. Um, the, the other is, is this, and I've been in this situation before at, at past stops. That you, your talent is not as good as the team that you're playing so you know that you have to hit one two three four trick plays we call them plays that matter but you have to hit a couple plays that matter in order to have an opportunity going forward Andy um at, with, with some of the teams on our schedule yeah we, we, we expect to reverse and, and we expect a flea flicker or a double pass or a fumble ruski um onside kicks fake punts um yes we expect some of those things going forward on the um fake punt the other night that worked against us it's 100 percent my fault i should have had our players more prepared than i did didn't expect them to come out with a left-footed punter um that that one got me and 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 i didn't scout it enough and and 100 percent my fault something that won't happen going forward we'll be prepared for that well, a learning experience for sure. I do want to stay with special teams. Uh, Terrell Brown burst onto the scene. Three returns of at least 40 yards, another one of 22 yards. What was his impact on the game, and how does that help your offense with the great starting field position? Yeah, Ter- Terrell had a good night the other night, returning punts and returning kicks. What gets left out of this now, and, and don't take anything away from Terrell, but the, the other 10 players that were blocking for him were, were phenomenal. And, and I probably wouldn't have scored either, just like Terrell didn't. But, but there's a lot of guys on our coaching staff that would have had 30- and 40-yard gains with the holes that were opened up. Um, really proud of the 10 young men blocking for him. And then Terrell did what he was supposed to do, which is hit the hole really, really fast. Several trends continued at Stevenson, five straight season opening wins, 10 straight night game wins. But here's one. Frostburg football has won the last 20 games in a row in which your football team has scored first. What does it mean when your team takes an early lead and why is it so hard for opponents to come back? Yeah, the, the, my, the mindset of young people, 18 to 22-year-olds, that, that they get out to a lead and, and, and they seem to relax and then they can just be themselves and play. Um, when you're behind, you, you, you tense up a little bit and you seem to stress a little more. Um, I, I don't know what our record is when we don't score first, but I, I know we've been pretty good here the last four seasons um, and plan to be good going forward. Um, but but you're, you're right. When we, when we score first, there, there just seems to be a, a relaxation that, that comes over everybody and we just – yeah, we pin our ears back and we get to be ourselves and we play really, really hard and really proud of the young men for that. Let's take a look towards next week. Traveling to TCNJ, a 49-14 win last season for Frostburg. However, the Lions peaked late last year. They won four out of their last five games, including catching Rowan and CNU for wins for TCNJ. Coach Goff was hired late last July. You guys played in week two last year. So he's had a lot more time with his team to prepare. How do you get your team ready to play and, and take TCNJ very seriously? Yeah, they, we're, we're going to take them seriously because it's the most important game on our schedule because it's the next game. Whoever you're playing next is the only one you need to focus on. It's the only thing that our coaching staff and our young men are looking at. Uh, Casey Golf, the head coach there, and also the defensive coordinator, does a nice job coaching that football program. Um, he was at Defiance College as the head coach before that and, and led Defiance College to its best season in over a decade when he was the head coach there. Um, they're going to get it turned around at TCNJ sooner or later. You don't want them to get it turned 
around the week that you're playing them. But you're right about last year. Had a really, really good end of their season. Um, TCNJ won four out of their last five. Uh, two shutouts. And, and I, they shut out, if I remember right, they shut out Rowan and then they shut out Southern Virginia. But you're right, beat Rowan and Christopher Newport, two of the upper-level teams in our conference. So that, that was impressive for them. Um, TCNJ played so poorly Friday night against FDU Floorham that, that that it's it's detrimental for our coaching staff and for our players to watch the film of last week because it's not the same team we're going to see this Saturday. They're going to come out in their home opener and they're going to play hard and they're going to play well and, and they're going to play with a purpose because they want to wipe last week everything that happened in their game last week. They want to wipe it off the books and, and I just expect a different football team and we need to be better. Uh, there's the bottom line. We need to be better than we were last week, too. So our focus today and tomorrow and throughout the rest of the week is let's get a little bit better each day and then go out on Saturday and have fun. Well, Coach, we appreciate it. Bobcats head to TCNJ this weekend. Good luck, and thank you for joining us. I appreciate you all having me. Next on week two of our fall sports Bobcast, we have men's soccer assistant coach Colton Flynn joining us this weekend. Men's soccer, a split over the weekend, a win over St. Vincent College, 3 to nothing, a 1-0 loss in double overtime to Randolph on a penalty kick. So, Colton, what did you learn about your team over this weekend that you couldn't have known really before you started playing in an actual game? I mean, I saw a lot of positives from this weekend. Um, I definitely thought the guys brought it on Sunday in the second half in overtime. They worked really hard um, on on Saturday, it was just about getting that first goal, and after that, I mean, it, it a lot of a lot of things were a lot easier after that. Um, but besides that, I mean, we've seen it all preseason. Different attitude, um, the mentality. Everyone wants to work hard for each other, and I mean, it brought over. We saw it over this weekend too. I want to start with the St. Vincent game. Frostburg three goals in the second half, the the highest scoring half for the Bobcats since last year at Penn State Altoona. What went right in that second half to find several quality goals? I mean, you saw in the first goal that, that there was a willing to, like, not be selfish. The guy dummied it, let it go through the guy's leg, and, and the next guy flicked it on to the back post for Haven to, to have a second two-time finish. And it, it was a great it was a great play because it just showed the unselfishness in the whole team, and they – we're just buying into it, and it was a great cross by... Uh, uh, it was Kamal through McComber's legs. <laughs> Putnam gave it one touch, and then Mackey found the back of the net. Yeah, it, it was it was a great play, and, um, I mean, that will definitely look good on the highlight clips for sure. Um, and then, obviously, Haven's free kick was an awesome free kick, and then to top it all off, you, you have Christian Danes come on and score an awesome header back post and just, I mean, and then he almost gets another one in like the 90th minute. So all the guys stepped up from the bench to the starting 11. It was a great, it was a great, it was just great by everyone because anyone we had on the bench, they came on and just the the level didn't drop. That's what the main thing that I look at in our bench is when someone comes on, can they bring something to the team that the guy that started and didn't bring or, can they just bring a mental the men same mentality the guys were starting, and that's what they did on Saturday for sure. Speaking to the level not dropping, uh, talking about a style of play. When when you talk to Coach Burns, you hear this all the time. We're we're going to build out of the back, mm -hmm. but this year we want to apply a little bit more pressure. What was the style your team achieved in St. Vincent, and and what was that level of play that didn't drop? I mean. Once we started switching the point of attack a lot more, um, it started opening up in the wide the wide spaces where we could get those 2v1s with our wingers and outside backs. It really helped out in those in those opportunities, and it, it gave us the ability to serve the ball, and that's how the third goal came, and then the second goal also came that way, was out wide, crossing it in. So definitely whenever we were switching the point of attack a lot more, it definitely opened up St. Vincent. It was, made it a lot easier for the guys in the middle to get on to the ball and finish it in the back of the net. I want to shift gears to the Randolph game. And talking to Coach Burns at halftime, he was he was very clear that he thought Frostburg was outplayed in the first half by Randolph. Um, how did the Bobcats, how did the team really handle that reality or that statement from the coaching staff and then respond in the second half in overtime? I mean, we told them all preseason that uh, 
we didn't have that same mentality that we had in, in every preseason game or the first game in St. Vincent where we're just all over the other team as soon as we win, we win the first or they win the first ball in the air, then we're on to the second. We They were winning all the second uh, balls, so they were fir- they were first to everything. And we just we just had to get into the guys and tell them, like, hey, this effort's not good enough and we got to bring it up. And I felt like the second half, they really, they really bought into it and the whole effort from everyone, from the goalkeeper to the, the number nine, everyone brought the effort and then – Anyone we brought on brought that same intensity, and it definitely showed in the second half. There was a a, a little twist to the this game on Sunday. It was very hot on that turf, especially when the sun was out. Uh, the bench was a little thin. I think Coach said that there were only six subs. How, how was there some mixing and matching of personnel, and how did you guys handle really the, the conditions and the fatigue as that game wore on? I mean, it was good because we got one or two guys back that was sick on Saturday that we didn't get to play. Um, yeah, I was looking down the bench, and I was like, oh, my God, we got more guys that are injured than actually mm-hmm. uh, healthy. So it, I was like, we we have a fine line of people that we can play. Um, but luckily we have a, a handful of guys like uh, Trevor Namey. He can play multiple positions. He can yep. come in the inside and play that attacking mid role, or he can go on the outside and play that out, uh, the right mid role. Randy Putnam can do the same thing. He can play the winger or the attacking mid role. Um, and we have Haven. Obviously, he can play the nine role or he can play that the out, out, out wide as the seven or 11. So, and Sam Bly, same way. So we have a handful of guys that are very versatile and can play both roles on the inside and outside. And that makes our life a lot easier when we have guys that can play multiple positions and are willing to just play wherever we, we need them to play and do the job. We got our first real good look at Joel Assal on Sunday. He only had to make two saves on Saturday against St. Vincent. Did you get what you expected out of him as a coaching staff? I think in terms of shot stopping, he, he did a really well good job. I mean, he came out on some crosses. He made some saves. Um, I feel like he can get better in the distribution part of his game. I mean, me and – um. Coach Seth, we were watching the film, all his touches that he had in um, the St. Vincent game, and uh, he still had some pl- ball, long balls that weren't even going anywhere near our guys. But, I mean, that's stuff we can work on in training and get better. Um, but in terms of his shot-stopping ability, it's everything we've seen in training. He loves to come out and try to win on 1v1s. He, he's, he's a good 1v1 goalkeeper. He's uh, good at coming out on crosses. He he's not scared. That's the number one thing as a goalkeeper. He's a little crazy. Like every goalkeeper, you need you need him to be a little crazy, uh-huh. a little bit a little bit out there. But um, yeah, he, I definitely uh, thought he did a good job this weekend. He he was impressive uh, to us on Sunday. And getting into the bigger picture here, uh, the back line looks to be really solid with Basham and Getz in the middle. Cameron Coates has stepped into that right side, and then Punya Salico on the left side. We saw a little bit of Jose Rodriguez back there as well. That unit looks solid, athletic, and skilled. Um, is that really going to be the backbone of this team this season? Yeah, I think last year we had a lot of question marks um, in the back line. We had uh, our right back especially was going in and out of the lineup. We didn't know who we were going to use there. We were just trying to find someone that would fit. And um, this year, I think, yeah, it's it's definitely our backbone of our team. Um, we've been doing this thing where it's called red, red – we're getting red shields for every clean sheet we have. So um, we got a red shield for St. Vincent, which mm-hmm. was good, and we got a red shield for Cal PA and uh, for Mount Aloysius for in the, the scrimmages. Yeah, yeah, in the preseason. So, yeah, we've uh, – the guys have really bought into trying to make sure – we're keeping the clean sheets, and I think it all starts with the back line. We're demanding more of the back line, more communication, being loud back there. I mean, me and Coach Seth, of uh, when we take the the defenders in uh, training, we're always uh, getting on them about being loud because a lot of them are like to be quiet. Uh, so I even heard Jose have a couple shouts for a switch. So that's good because he's a really quiet freshman. Mm-hmm. Um, Cam- Cameron Coates is just – phenomenal his work rate is like none other he's going to get up and down that line all day um and as soon as you think he loses the ball somehow he sticks a foot in and gets it back and just runs up with it um Blake Basham and Blake or Brett Basham and Blake Getz is just 
they're phenomenal in the air. Um, I think they were getting their head on everything in terms of the corners and long throw-ins we were having. So they're great in the air, and they attack the ball well. Um, besides that, though, I think with them and um, Joel, I mean, in the our back line, our goalkeeper is pretty solid right now. Um, so, yeah. That certainly looks to be a strength of this team. Finally, last two questions for you here, Colton. This weekend, we're games number one and two for the season. We we didn't really expect a, a finished product from this team, especially with so many injuries. If this is the starting point this past weekend, where do you want to improve? Obviously, I mean, we did get shut up, shut out in one game, and um, I don't like getting shut out. I like to score goals. I mean, I'm a center back, so I'd rather keep a clean sheet than score goals, but at the end of the day, you need goals to win games. Mm -hmm. um, so we're still looking for those attacking options. I mean, we got a couple guys injured that can play, can play in those attacking roles more that should be healthy by the end of the week or by uh, the end of this weekend or something. So we'll see how that goes. Um, yeah, I mean, we're just looking to find the right combination up top where the chemistry gels and um, guys are finding – finding the right chemistry and can get on the goal and score some goals for us. Absolutely. The Coach Burns' answer there would be, we have to score. We have to score. We have exactly, to score. yeah. <laughs> Finally, uh, Wednesday at Johns Hopkins, then in Carolina for Pfeiffer and Methodist. What are you looking for out of this Frostburg State men's soccer team this week? I mean, our short-term goals were win three of the five. So right now we're one on one, and uh, so we at least need to win two of the three this weekend to complete those goals. Um John Hopkins is off. They're definitely a good test. Um, they're top. T I think they're top ten in the nation right now. So they are going to be a good game. Um, last year it was 3-0, but if you look at the goals, it shouldn't have been a 3-0 game. It should have been a lot closer than what it was. Um, but I mean, it's anyone's game. We've we've scouted them. We're going to work on what we're going to do this on tomorrow. Um, it's yeah, it's going to be tough, but. If we work hard and we have that same mentality we took in the second half of Randolph and the St. Vincent game, I think it will be a close game. I mean, in Division Three, it's every game's close. I mean, we if you look at last year's record, it's, it's it was a one goal difference for probably ten or eleven of our, the games we played, win or loss. Even in conference play, Mary Washington, York, exactly, games. Yep. exactly. Um, so it, it's Salisbury too. Um, so it's it's a hit or miss swing. It just depends on who finishes their opportunities. Um, I know they're all American. I think still injured, so that will help us out. And then Pfeiffer had a tough. They played some tough teams like CNU la last weekend and Greensboro College, I think. Um, but yeah, we've we've been looking at we've been watching the film and trying to get the guys best prepared for the games and make sure everyone comes in healthy. Colton Flynn. Thank you for stepping in this week and joining us in the Bobcats. Good luck, Thank Bobcats. Good luck this week. Thank you. It is week two of the Bobcast, and we're talking to cross-country head coach Dale Louie. And, Coach, your runners ran Friday night at Shippensburg, the Galen Piper Cross-Country Challenge. The men took eighth. The women sent four runners, so the team did not take a score. Uh, top performers, Robbie Romano finishing eighth overall, Braxton Clark 36th. On the women's side, Sarah McCurry, 56th, and Lauren Halverson, 89th. Uh, generally speaking, what, what did you see out of your teams on Friday night? Uh, well, uh, some of what I saw uh, I didn't like. <laughs> uh, I, I was a little disappointed. Uh, you know, we've been training, I think, a lot better than we, we race there uh, Friday evening. So, uh, but first meet, and, and uh, you know, we hopefully learn some things and, and go from there. Uh, our, our top runner on both sides, you, you mentioned Sarah and, and Robbie, both uh, I thought uh, ran well. Uh, both of them uh, improved upon uh, prior times. And, uh, you know, the competition up there is always always good. Uh, you know, you, you'd kind of like to be a little higher up in the uh, the team standings and stuff. But sometimes you got to put it in perspective. I mean, uh, Shippensburg uh, ranked in the, the top ten of Division Two. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, Dickinson and uh, Gettysburg and York uh, teams, uh, men and or women, uh, all 
ranked in uh, the top 10 in the, in the, in the region, Division Three. Uh, one school didn't make it there. Elizabethtown was supposed to have been there. would have been nice because they were also ranked. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they had uh, uh, flooding in their area, their uh, minor stadiums. Oh, was. Friday night we had our, our women's soccer game scratched because of the weather. Yep. Yeah. So, anyways, we uh, uh, I, I kind of felt on the men's side that uh, some of the folks went out a little perhaps too fast. Uh, not crazy fast, but just a, a little bit too quick of a tempo. And uh, and had a hard time holding that, you know. Once once you start to start hitting that wall, it's a little hard to keep fighting through it. And and you know that's really what happened on our, our men's side. So a little disappointed with that because uh, you know we we have some people who've run there before, and and I would have expected a little bit better. Uh, my take was uh, that uh, on the plus side of that, uh, I think they tried to be a little bit more aggressive and a little bit more competitive. And there's nothing to matter with that, you know, uh, especially first meet of the year. Uh, you, you hope that they, uh, you know, learn just what are their uh, limits at certain points in the year. Uh, I, you know, I said to the team, I was, I was probably uh, a little bit more pleased with, with the women than the men because uh, uh, we definitely are not in, in condition on that side of, uh, of our teams. Uh, but they ran relatively smart and uh, kept plugging along. And, and uh, I, I actually thought that they – did a pretty nice job for, for where we're at right right now. I want to get a little bit farther into uh, Shippensburg as, as a course. It's kind of unique. You mentioned the, the top-notch competition. It's a, it's a Friday night start, and it's a shorter course. What's the rationale bes- be- for choosing Shippensburg as, as the, the meet to start your season? Uh, in the past, uh, you know, just looking for some good competition close, close to home because we do – a bunch of traveling and stuff. Uh, you know, these distance people are on the road for the entire academic year uh, because we really don't have many home home events and things. Uh, so you're trying to, you know, I sometimes try to look for, you know, uh, there's some shorter trips that are, are worthwhile. And so that's one of the reasons. Uh, we actually were orig- originally, as, as you probably well know there, we were originally scheduled to go somewhere else and, mm-hmm. and then that meet was, was canceled. So uh, we, we went to our old standby of, of, of Shippensburg. On the plus side, I mean, it, they're thousand meter loops. Uh, it's it's flat. Uh, there are dozens of turns because all you're doing is running around soccer fields and hanging lefts and hanging rights mm-hmm. and <laughs> and whatnot. So you know that does detract a little bit from this you know from the speed of the of the flatness, uh, particularly I think early in the race where. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know, it's almost like like to start at a Boston Marathon there with everybody jammed together and everything. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but you know, we've been there a couple of years, so uh, you know, we can uh, haul out uh, how they've performed. You know, like uh, the senior class, they've been there four years now, so we could haul out prior to the meet. You know, this is what you've done over the last four years, and and uh, splits as well as final times and things, and. Uh, we're harping all the time on you know you this is a thinking man sport you know you just you you just can't run uh i mean you can but you're not going to get the results that mm-hmm. you, you should unless you start thinking uh so we we work on that and and you know in that regard like i said i think some of them were thinking about being a little bit more aggressive uh which was a good thing uh i think some of them got a little too caught up uh in that and and being early in the year it's a little hard to you know hard to fight through that a little on the warm side. Sure. Uh, you know, it could have been a lot worse. We've been up there and a lot worse. Uh, you know, and that starts to sap you a little bit too. Something that was, was interesting to talk about in our preseason conversation was you weren't really sure who those scorers three to nine that would show up and put together strong times. And you've already mentioned that, that a lot of guys were aggressive early on and had trouble maintaining it. So who were the guys three through nine that really showed up and, and gave you something and, and the staff to, to look at? Uh, well, I mean, I'll actually bump up one, if you don't mind, sure. <laughs> to number two Braxton there, because, you know, last year, you know, he was part of that, you know, mm-hmm. actually two through nine or, you know, uh, group there or whatever. So uh, it wasn't a surprise that, you know, he's, you know, he's, he stepped it up during, last year he stepped it up every single season that he ran, indoors to outdoors, you know, uh, the end of the last outdoor season, uh, he and a couple others took on that 10K, 5K double at the conference championships, and and, and he did remarkably, you know, well with that, and 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 he's uh, he pushes it in practice. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt about it at all. 
uh, you know, he's with the top group training, you know, day in and day out. So he showed a lot of improvement. Uh, you know, he's, uh, uh, there's a point in the races there where, uh, I think that he needs to learn to relax a little bit You know, you run, run fast, but relax. And, and that's a, an art form. Uh, and in that whole three through nine group, you know, that's fallen back a little bit. Like I said, you know, that continues to be something they need to work on, you know, versus Robbie who, you know, uh, you know, four years in, you know, he's, he's showing that ability to, to do that. So, uh, I can't help you out too much with, you know, who, who's going to be in that three through nine. Uh, -huh. <laughs> uh, you know, it was, uh, mixed up, uh, even a little bit more than I, I, I thought it would be there, uh, Friday evening, which I think is, is, uh, an excellent problem to have. Uh, I, not a problem, but it's, it's, it's a luxury really. Sure. Uh, because most of our, even our conference championships, we can run on a limited number of people. So, uh, I mean, it's great if we can put 20 guys out there and, and, uh, you know, they mix it up because, you know, not everybody's going to be in the game every, every week and stuff. So, uh, Fisher Wheeler is a freshman, you know, continues mm -hmm. to, to show well. Uh, we, uh, uh, We've had some guys stepping up well in practice. You know, Lorenzo Wilson as a junior has, has really uh, shown, I think, a, a higher level of commitment, uh, which uh, is a very good sign because, you know, we all believe that Lorenzo is, is somebody that can be in that three through nine, you know, group there. Uh, Jake Rickards has looked pretty well, uh, pretty good, uh, a little bit banged up, uh, probably affected him a little bit there the other the other evening. Uh, Matt Whitley in that group uh, is, you know, if I, I would give him a nickname uh, besides Hula Hoop Man, the, the nickname would be uh, Mr. Steady. Uh -huh. uh, you know, he, uh, uh, you know, he comes around every every meet, and uh, and we need that. You know, we really need somebody like Matt to uh, to to take a look at and, and figure. Okay, almost every meet he's going to be in that top, you know, that top seven, top nine or so. Uh, you know, because then you got some others there that, I mean, Matt knows he's not going to be number one on our team. Mm -hmm. All right. But, but Matt also has his own personal goals and, and, you know, when that drives him, that helps to drive the rest of the team as, as well. And you have seven who can affect the, the scoring in every single meet. And that men's team certainly is, is deep uh, enough to do that. I, I want to talk about how did the men's team work together. And, and last year around championship time, we talked more about, uh, in cross country, working together as a team. How early in the season do you do you think about or try to work on that aspect of racing? Uh, right from the get go. Uh, in fact, yesterday in our debriefing, uh, we were touching on that particular topic. Uh, not so much from a race standpoint, but from warming up, warming down, and things. And sure, you know, we we always need to do some better uh, things with that there. And 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 you know, we're. I'm always harping on that, you know. I said, you guys are going to have to listen to me until you start doing it. Uh, so race-wise, you know, they they went out in some nice packs there. You know, Robbie and Braxton were working together, and, and we had some real nice clumps. Uh, uh, the, the women did the same thing. You know, uh, Sid and, and, and Jayla did a real nice job of, of working together there. Uh, and uh, so we'll continue to, to, to preach that. Uh, we, uh, we need to get in a little better shape, you know, across the board to – to be a little bit more effective in, in doing that. Uh, you know, Colin Flynn uh, uh, got actually trampled and run over uh, in the first 100 meters of the race, and he was laying in the field all by himself. He's still our third finisher. <laughs> right, yeah. still our third finisher. And, you know, and part of that was the fact that, uh, you know, he was will willing to go after it. and and But we had enough guys out there that, you know, he could kind of start to gauge, all right, here, you know, this is where I ought to be, you know, and he used those guys, I think, as some – some benchmarks to, to move up during the race. And like you said, he, he worked his way up to third on the team and stuff. Well, finally, you have a set of results here from, from the first meet beyond just your training. Where are your teams in terms of, of their conditioning compared to your plans for their conditioning at this time of year? Uh, we, you know, I, 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 I said this before, I, I think we're on the men's side. You know, we've got uh, a base of conditioning that exceeds you know, what we've had in the past, uh, you know, we have a, a little bit more older team, but we have a whole bunch of new people as well. So, but even those new people have shown themselves very willing to, to go out there and work and, and, and get better on a consistent basis. So, uh, 
you know, women, there's nowhere to go, you know, uh, other than to get in better shape. Uh, and, you know, they they have been doing that. And, and I think their performances will jump up relatively quickly because some of them, all of them have some experience and stuff. And it's a little easier to, you know, kind of bounce back. And uh, their attitude has been, you know, I think pretty good considering that, uh, you know, we have a small team there. Uh, and uh, it's going to be kind of interesting to see where they end up at the end of the year. I think if they keep their heads and keep working at it, you know, we'll we'll be okay on that side too. Sure. Finally, let's look ahead to this weekend, the, the Westmoreland Invitational. Uh, Frostburg typically fa- fares pretty well in terms of the, the team results. However, you know, I know how you measure success. A lot of runners going against their own previous times. What are you looking for out of your runners this weekend? Uh, well, it's a shorter race for the men. Uh, and, and so that, you know, will help us in terms of some turnover and, uh, for some of the freshmen coming in, it's, it's back to familiarity. Sure. Uh, Cause a lot of them have run five K's in, in high school and stuff. So it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how some of them want to rip it off, so to speak, uh, at that, you know, at that shorter distance, uh, the women actually step up. And I think, uh, considering where our women are at this year, that's actually a you know a good direction to go uh, for our women. You know, extend them uh, you know another thousand meters or so. Uh, unfortunately, the course has changed a little bit from from the other years we've run, so uh, it'll be a little difficult you know to measure oh, that you okay. know, in that way. Uh, although uh, the way I look at the course, it looks like it might actually run faster than it uh, than it has in in the past uh, because. Uh, what were uh, some uphills are now some downhills. And uh, so that'll be good because it'll give us a chance to, to see, especially our newer people, you know, how do mm-hmm. they run the downhills? Because uh, there's, again, a little bit of a technique involved there. And uh, they still have uphills there. Uh, and uh, one rather short and dramatic in the direction they're going this year. So uh, we're really going to have to be thinking about uh, – uh, flowing into that otherwise uh in the last thousand meters that's going to be a not very pretty sight Uh (laughs) uh-huh yeah just making it to the finish line well the the bobcats have fared pretty well at the westmoreland cc invitational we're looking forward to it dale louie we'll see you next week thanks for joining us all right thank you very much Andy. take care next up on the bobcast we have frostburg state volleyball assistant coach nicole regner in her first season with the Bobcats, however, she's no stranger to Coach Fletcher as she was a, a four-year player for Coach Fletcher at a previous stop. So let's get into Frostburg State this season, 2-2 two and two at the St. Vincent Bearcat Challenge. Uh, losses to St. Vincent and Westminster, wins over Allegheny and Waynesburg. And Coach, overall, how did the team play, and did you learn anything new about your squad? Well, we are a young team. We have seven juniors and then seven freshmen. So putting a team on the court that can mesh well for your first showing is a lot of, it's like playing chess almost. You have to put the people in positions where they play next to each other. And we played, I guess, as we expected. We were up against St. Vincent, which was one of the tougher teams at the tournament right off the bat. Mm -hmm. So we could learn from them and progress as the day and the tournament went on. And Westminster as well. Westminster, we saw win the ECAC tournament last year here, the number one team in the PAC preseason poll. So you go from St. Vincent and Westminster on day one to playing Allegheny and Waynesburg in day two. Those were two wins. Can you give examples of how your team or how the, the Bobcats progressed into day two? Yeah, um, well, as coaches, we got together and, you know, we definitely tweaked the lineup. We really saw, you know, who could play better next to each other, um, where people's strengths were, um, and we like to play off people's strengths. You know, that's how you win games. So we changed the lineup up, and they ended up playing really, really solid volleyball. There's obviously things that we can improve on, and there are always things to improve on. But as a team, they grew together and learned how to win together, being that we had, I think, a majority of freshmen on the court at one point. Uh, Three out of your first four uh, in terms of kills over the weekend were 
either newcomers or freshmen, yeah. including Haley Ultimus, who led the team with three kills per set. Also, in, in terms of total attacks, she led the team. So, including Ultimus, uh, Barkdahl, Godlove, some of those newcomers, H how did they look and how did they sort of ease into the, the beginning of their college careers? Um, for a lot of them, these were um, literally first college games for them. Um, God loves a transfer, so this was a different level for her. Um, the speed of the game is different at this level. So they held their own, which we're really proud of, and they can only go up from here, which we're excited to see them grow and continue with. I want to hit on another difference, day one to day two. Day one, 49 errors in two games. Day two, only 24 errors in two games. How were – how – how was your team able to be more efficient, especially in terms of hitting in day, in day number two? Defense, 100% difference. Um, we were able, with the tweaking of the lineup, to create more defensive opportunities for our you know, DSs and our libero, um, as well as blocking opportunities as well. So that eliminated a lot of the errors as a whole um, as a team. And in talking to Becky for preseason play, she was really excited about a lot of the returners in that arena, uh, Corey Smothers, Hannah Brown, Katie Lowe, are all juniors. They're all back. How would you rate the, the serve-receive group and the passing for the first weekend? Um, I think it went really well. It's where we are at and where we're expected to be at, I think, at this point. Um, Becky, has, that's been the bread and, bread and butter of the team, has been defense and serve-receive. Um, we definitely are tweaking and we're kind of going back to the basics and reteaching it to everybody else. And we're looking to those juniors to step up um, and really show, especially the freshmen and newcomers, you know, where we're at and we can only go up from there. So mm -hmm. they're setting the expectation. Setting a good starting point yeah, absolutely. Uh, for a team that has a lot of newcomers to the roster. Uh, last year's team, a lot of seniors, a lot of experience, and they played a lot of competitive matches, many that went five sets and many competitive sets even within those matches. We saw a, a very competitive set at the end of the Allegheny game. Your group faced a set point, came back and won 26-24. How important is it to play sets like that early in the season with a young group and actually win those sets and build that confidence? Learning to finish is huge. That is, you know, we work on gameplay like that all the time in practice where you have to score the last, you know, three, four points in order to win, you know, the drill. Um, so we practice those things, the pressure, you know, sometimes being a freshman or being a newcomer, pressure can get the best of you. So we do a lot of gameplay situations that prepare them. But in game situation, that's the best experience for them. So I'm glad we were able to finish an experience and end strong. Um, but we're going to have to continue that as we go. I'm switching gears to Biamba Shatenge in the middle. Her numbers look very productive. 242 kills per set, a 250 hitting percentage, seven blocks and 12 sets. My question was, ha has she picked up where she left off last season? But this is your first year with us, uh, Coach Regner. What has it been like to work with Biamba here early on, and, and how has she been a leader for this team? Oh, my gosh, she is fantastic. Um, Bianca and I are definitely getting to know each other, you know, as coach and player, but she definitely teaches me a lot. And I definitely think she's picking up where she left off. Um, I come in with a lot of setting, hitting, relationship background. So I'm really working with her and our setters to build that relationship to only get them stronger. Um, and I'm really excited to see her leadership grow, not only on the court, but off the court as well. And finally, coming out of the weekend, what are you looking to approve upon this week? Um, I think overall team team playing, like the actual on the court um, experience, you only get that when you really are up against on a competitive level. Um, so Wednesday is really going to be with our game on Wednesday. It's going to be another way for us to grow. Um, we definitely have some things to work defensively and offensively, but as a team, I think as we grow together, it's only going to make us stronger. Well, we're excited for it. Wednesday is our Bobcat home opener. Penn State Altoona comes here for a 7 p.m. start. This weekend, Frostburg heads to, heads to Brockport to play Teal, Brockport, Bald Baldwin-Wallace, and SUNY Potsdam. What are you looking for out of your team this week with the slate of games that you have? To play competitive. Be competitive and put it all on the court. Um, we teach our girls that, you know, practice how you want to play. So as long as they show up to practice, I know that we'll show up to play. And it's going to be a learning curve. These are top 
like I think they're top ranked teams for sure. So these are going to be some of the tougher teams we see, and it's going to prepare us for conference play. So it's the best opportunity for us. Well, we're looking forward to it. We'll have the opener on Wednesday on the Bobcat Sports Network. Nicole Regner, your Bobcast debut. Thank you for joining me. <laughs> Thanks so much. Next on the Bobcast here in week two is field hockey with Frostburg State head coach Caitlin Thompson. Field hockey, a 2-0 loss to E-Town in the opener. Also fell at Lynchburg on Monday. Uh, and looking at the Elizabethtown game, two penalty corner goals for Elizabethtown. Emmy Nelson, a pair of defensive saves for the first year. Gabby Rahuba, two of the Bobcats, three shots on the day. Coach, what did you see from your team in your opener that you liked? Yeah, we we liked that um, a lot of the new freshmen got involved, a lot of the new players. We have eight girls on the roster this year that did not play college field hockey last year, so a lot of them got involved in the Elizabethtown game and kind of shook their nerves away a little bit. Um, Emmy Nelson debuting in her first game really just had a fantastic game. Um, so we were proud of that and just proud of all of our new players coming in and looking great. Uh, Kaylin Gardner, who played for the soccer team last year, came in um, and did a fantastic job for us against Elizabethtown and Lynchburg. So we've also been really proud of her as well. I think the story of the E-Town game came down to a couple of things. First was E-Town ended the game with 14 penalty corners, which led to, to both goals, including the one at the end of the first half. Frostburg only had one penalty corner. Um, how big is a discrepancy like that in deciding a field hockey game, and, and how do you try to even things out? It's definitely important for us to limit our defensive penalty corners and earn more attacking penalty corners. Um, against Elizabethtown, we just had to do a better job of working the ball up the field to get into our attacking circle and earn those corners. And um, against Elizabethtown, you know, they were knocking quite often, so it's hard as a defender to kind of keep it clean in there um, for such a long time. So we kind of really need to uh, help from our attack and our midfield to alleviate some of that pressure that the defenders and Smizer were receiving that entire game um, so that we can kind of diminish those numbers a little bit. You mentioned the other thing I wanted to hit on from the Elizabethtown game, Transi transitioning from your defensive third to the offensive third, because even on your one penalty corner, you got a nice look from, from Gabby Rahuba on the left side. With so many new faces, especially in the midfield, how much of a challenge is it to move the ball from the back end to the front, and how can that improve throughout the year? Yeah, we we definitely did a better job of that against um, Lynchburg. That's been all preseason. A strength of ours is moving that ball around pressure, um, and we look really different from last year to this year as a team doing that. I think um, we kind of, uh, you know, had – didn't really do a good job in our first game of doing that. Um, so against Lynchburg, who is a fantastic program, we really did have some moments that looked really great, and Lynchburg did not know how to handle us at times, um, especially in the first half. Um, so if we just continue to work, build on that base, we'll definitely be uh, set in the future um, moving forward. And that was an area of the midfield where both Ivy Meisner and Liz Davis were last year, and they've graduated. Um, I do want to hit on the Lynchburg game. Uh, the Hornets, last year, ODAC runner-ups, uh, perennially a, a strong program. To play a team like Lynchburg, and you'll play Juniata, and then in your own conference you play quality teams. Uh, you can't beat a quality team without playing them first. Uh, I know it's a discouraging result, but were there moments you pulled out of Lynchburg, as you mentioned, moving the ball that you really want to build on? Yeah, for sure. We looked we looked really good when we were playing our type of two-touch hockey up the field. Um, like I said, there were moments when we were transitioning from defense to offense that Lynchburg was just unable to handle us, and that's a team that I expect will be receiving top 20 votes in the mm -hmm. near future. So for us to see that so early in um in the season with as many new players as we have is really encouraging for moving forward um for later on when we play against those CAC teams who are already in the top 20. 
How is your team's conditioning right now, especially early in the season where it can be very hot on the turf? Do you like where your team is? And, and really, as the season moves on, what are you looking for in that capacity? We definitely suffered a little bit yesterday from the heat. It was the feels like was basically over 100 degrees mm -hmm. and it was a very tough game. Um, and we pushed through it in the first ha half and probably a little bit into the second half of the game. But uh, we definitely faltered towards the end. And I think that that um, is where some of those kind of lopsided stats ended up being. So we need to just do a better job of when we're tired um, physically to not make mental mistakes um, that are going to cost us in the end. And we talked about that during the game. So um, th now that the girls are kind of aware of it and aware of solutions of how to fix it, uh, we're hoping moving forward that it's not as bad of a result. So through the two games, we're still searching for that first goal. What's what's the attitude of the team, and what is the really the message you want to give your team this week to, to keep pushing and find that first goal? Yeah, we played really tough teams to open up the to open up the season, and I'm kind of glad we did because you know this is the, the these are the types of teams we're going to face when yep. it comes to CAC time. So you know the fact that we're able to see some of these bright things happening on the field um, so early in the season with all the new players that we have. Um, it's going to happen for us um, as we move forward and as we keep practicing things. You know, we have lots of talent in that forward line and on the midfield line and basically everywhere. It's just we really need to um, get hungry and find the goal when we're inside of our attacking pen or our attacking circle. Finally, this week, uh, we're looking ahead to Randolph-Macon on Sunday. That was an overtime loss early last season. What are you looking for from your squad uh, in that game? Just playing with heart, playing with intensity, playing with mental toughness, um, holding yourselves accountable. You know, if you mess up on a play, go to that next play, but hold yourself accountable for getting that next play right, you know. Um, so just doing – staying in our game mentally so that way we are able to execute our skills physically. Well, we're looking forward to it. Randolph Macon on the road on Sunday. Caitlin Thompson, thank you for joining Thanks. me this week.